Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. I really hope that all of you are keeping yourself busy and not letting social distancing drive you wild. Well, quarantine is truly getting on my nerves which is why I thought it's finally time to start recording capsule videos to ensure that that bright brain of yours stays in business. Before we begin, let me just give you a little heads up. There are too many lessons in the text that deal with the concept of poverty and child labor. I understand that this might seem a little depressing to you, but I really want you to wait and see the details which are mentioned in the text that's going to make it a little interesting for you to read. The lesson that we're going to take today and discuss is Lost Spring, Stories of Stolen Childhood. Lost Spring is a lesson which is way more emotional than any of the 90s Bollywood movies that you've been watching. So grab your box of tissues and let's get started. So let's begin by asking some questions. Do you think someone's childhood can actually be stolen? And if so, can a stolen childhood ever be compensated for? You know, when we listen to the title Lost Spring, it comes to our mind. Is there any symbolic meaning attached to the season spring in the title? And if so, is there any similarity between childhood, the most youthful and beautiful part of our life, and the season spring? A time of the year which is full of youth, vitality, freshness and newness. This lesson has been written by Anis Jha. She is an Indian female author, columnist, journalist and so much more. In this lesson, Anis Jung has actually talked about the deplorable condition of poor children and how these children who are so poverty stricken are forced to miss the most beautiful part of their life that is their childhood because of their socio-economic conditions. It is this uh, compulsion that these children have to face that does not allow them to even think of a hopeful future. The first part is, sometimes I find a rupee in the garbage. The lesson begins with the author's encounter with Sahib, a rag picker. If you don't know what rag pickers mean, they are people who walk around collecting garbage and trying to see if there is anything useful in that that they can actually earn a little money from. In Hindi, we usually call them kabadi wale. The author then asks Sahib, why he's going through garbage dumps and Sahib tells her that sometimes he finds a rupee in the garbage. So little boys who are actually rag pickers like him are always scrounging which means thoroughly searching for gold in the garbage. You know for us garbage is something that we would never want to associate ourselves with but for these kids garbage is like a source of wonder. It is like a means of survival and it is based on this occupation that they are actually getting a livelihood and they're able to support themselves. So you know the author actually ends up asking Sahib that is this something that he really wants to do if, if you know it is really worth for him to go through garbage and try to find something useful and that's when Sahib tells the author that I have nothing else to do you know there is nothing uh, else that he can actually engage himself in. And that's when the author feels really bad and you know how we typical, uh, you know, privileged ones always tell these people that why don't you go to school and why don't you get yourself educated and Sahib says that there is no school in his neighborhood and that's when the author asks him that if I start a school would you go there and he says of course and a few days, you know, later when Sahib actually meets the author, he asks her that have you started the school yet? And you know, she feels so embarrassed that she said something that she didn't mean that that was actually a possibility that she would never be able to provide Sahib. And she feels very hollow on doing that. So I'll just give you a little background about Sahib. Sahib's family is a, a group of people who are migrants from Bangladesh. They were living in Dhaka in the green fields in a beautiful place but then that place could not give them food to eat. They had no means of survival which is why they left all that greenery and all that beauty just to come to India, to Delhi to find work and now they are living in Simapuri. Simapuri is on the periphery of Delhi. It's like periphery means corner so it is right at the corner of Delhi and yet it does not enjoy any of the uh, luxurious uh, lifestyle that 
the city has i mean delhi is the national capital and yet simapuri does not have uh, that slum area does not even have um, drainage it doesn't have water it does not have toilets it does not have concrete structures these are basically houses which are made of mud and they can they're not stable so this family has been going around pitching their tents anywhere they find food and they find a means of survival the author actually makes a very uh, ironic statement by saying that they don't even have an identity yet they have ration cards they have something that's going to get them food so basically food is more important to these people than an identity i mean than an identity this is something that we really need to uh, pay attention to here you know one incident in the lesson which is really heartbreaking and it actually broke my heart was that uh, one day the author actually finds uh, sahib standing next to a tennis court and he's very intensely watching two people play this game when he's watching this game sahib is very careful he's outside the boundary of the court and he's looking at the men who are dressed all in white and they're very nice and comfortable shoes this is a very big deal you know because sahib is looking at the shoes of this man he is a boy who has always walked barefoot and you know in such a scenario even shoes become a dream for you and tennis it's completely out of his reach the sport that he's actually standing in and admiring there is no way he's ever going to get any chance to play it there is a complete transition that you find towards the end of the first part so far sahib was a free rag picker he was looking through garbage and it was full of wonder full of surprises for him the author has found sahib to carry a steel canister and uh, he's actually he's handling it and he now works in a tea stall and he's earning 800 rupees on all his meals now any uh, anyone who's reading the book or this lesson is going to feel that uh, working as a person uh, you know delivering tea would actually be an upgrade from a rag, rag picker who's actually having to go through garbage but if you think about it when sahib was going through all the garbage he was a master of his own world he was someone who was in charge of his own destiny he could do whatever whatever he would find in the garbage that would be his so there was opportunity there was thrill he is no longer his own master he is someone who is employed and he doesn't seem very happy working at a tea stall which goes on to establish a very important theme in the lesson saying that for us our importance uh, you know is felt mostly from the kind of independence we enjoy Sahib is getting in hundred rupees. Uh, most probably, he's doing better as a person who works at a tea stall. But he doesn't have that thrill, that you know, feeling of opportunity anymore. He's become a slave. He's become a labor laborer, and he's lost his carefree look. And that is the first instance where we get to know that he has lost his childhood completely. This is actually a literary device alert, so pay attention. Sahib's name, Sahib e Alam. If you know a little bit of Hindi or Urdu, you would know Sahib e Alam means Master of the Universe. That name is so ironic. This person is scrounging through garbage, going on to finally work at a tea stall as someone's labourer, and now, if you see, his name is full of promise. His name is full of hope. Sahib e Alam, Master of the Universe. The next part of the lesson is I want to drive a car. Now this is the story of a boy Mukesh. Mukesh is someone who is the son of a bangle maker and he wants to be a mechanic. You know if you've ever heard uh, Firozabad is a small town in India which is really famous for its glass bangles, the colorful, shiny, gorgeous glass bangles that are such a such an important part of the Indian culture. And Mukesh's father is someone who is uh, you know who has been in this uh, field for a very long time he's been a bangle maker and mukesh also is learning the trade but mukesh actually wants to be a mechanic he does not want to be a bangle maker what we need to realize here is that families in ferozabad have spent generations working around bright furnaces which is like the light that people use to you know uh, change the shape of the glass and make it form into bangles welding it making bangles and all of that the workplace that is the rooms in which these boys these little kids are making their bangles they are 
very dingy they are like without any light they're dingy cells which are almost um, you know there is no air flow it is almost making you claustrophobic and these people slog their daylight hours which means they are working throughout the day in these dark crammed up cells they're working with very bright light and you know the repercussion of this of this is more often than not people who reach a particular stage of life they lose the sight they they become blind because of the kind of conditions that these people are working in if the law is enforced properly bukesh and the 20000 children who are working in this industry they would not be allowed to do this but then the problem is no one is there to get them out of the situation now the uh, author actually meets mukesh and mukesh is very excited to show her his house which is now renovated so he takes the author by the hand and they walk in uh, these very tiny lanes which are stinking and they're choked they're almost full of uh, garbage and these people are walking past Uh, walls which are crumbling and houses which have no doors no windows basically the whole way the author walks to mukesh's house describes the sheer poverty that mukesh is living in however if you come to see mukesh is still better than saheb because at least he has a permanent house so you know finally they manage to reach uh, mukesh's house and that's when the author sees that it's a very um, it's a house which is a uh, thatched with dead grass and um, it is almost half built it's almost a shack it's not even a proper house and uh, as she enters she sees a very old lady working by the uh, firewood stove the chula that we call in hindi and she is the wife of mukesh's elder brother so basically the sister in law of mukesh bhabhi and already in charge of this lady is already in charge of the three men they're cooking everything okay and she's the lady of the house despite long years of hard labor mukesh's father who first worked as a tailor and then as a bangal maker failed to renovate a house he was not even able to build a house he could not send his sons to school to get educated and all he managed to do was teach them the only thing that he knows the art of bangal making and uh, you know Mukesh's grandmother has watched her own husband go blind with the dust from polishing the glass bangles and you know what she says she says it's it's our karma it's our destiny and she says that this is what we are born to do and what this shows is the very deeply embedded caste system and the the you know the prejudices that we live with in the indian system and she is implying that there is a god given lineage that cannot be broken these people are working in dark hutments next to lines of flames of flickering oil lamps and their eyes are more adjusted to the dark than it is to the light and they often lose end up losing their eyesight before they even become adults finally in this lesson we are introduced to this young girl sapita and she is a young girl in a drab pink dress and she's sitting alongside an elderly woman and she's soldering um, pieces of glass together and uh, you know she does not even know the sanctity or the importance or the piousness of the bangle she is making she's just making them because it's her livelihood and the old woman who's in who's beside her has um, not even enjoyed a full meal in her entire life she says ek ek ser bhar khana bhi nahi khaya which means she's never had a meal which has um, satisfied her entire appetite her husband is an old man with a flowing beard and he knows nothing except making bangles can you see how these people are so trapped in this profession there's no way out their ancestors knew how to make uh, bangles that's what they've taught them they've always been this poor so there is no means for them to get educated and come out of this whole a uh, scenario they have always been bangle makers and there's literally no hope for them to escape the profession of bangle making and um they are uh, unwilling they they want to get into a group to protest against these horrible conditions but then they're very scared that what if the police comes and beats them up i think i don't have to explain to you how we are all subject to certain brutality that everyone is scared of before speaking against what our rights are and there is no leader among them who can actually do this for them no one helps them to see things differently and all of them appear tired at all times they 
talk of poverty greed injustice but then there is absolutely nothing that they can do about it now you know what is very important here is that the author has contrasted two very different worlds together one is the haves and one is the have nots we have been talking about the have nots so far but let's talk about the haves these are the people who are not going to let these bangle makers come out of this horrible misery and this this entire group comprises of money lenders middlemen policemen the keepers of law the politicians who are making promises and not fulfilling them you know together all these people have put this burden this baggage on this entire community of bangle makers and they are accepting it naturally like their parents did like their grandparents did they believe that it's their karma you know they have been made to feel so insignificant for such a long time that now it is almost impossible for them to think of an option but mukesh is not entirely from this category of people because these people have lost all faith but mukesh still has some hope that one day he's going to become a mechanic and that's when the author you know asks him that how about you become a pilot like fly a plane and that's when the lesson ends by saying that me- being a mechanic is still okay it is still a possible fantasy because he has seen cars very few planes fly over ferozabad a world which is so distant from mukesh that even dreaming is not allowed 